Okay, so we're back now. So, uh, what what year did you go to Korea? You remember? Uh, Would have been early fifty something, right? Fifty, I guess, in nineteen fifty. Yeah. One of the strange things, I had a sergeant, a master sergeant, that had been in World War Two, and uh, he kept bugging us for a commission. He wanted a commission. He wanted a second lieutenant. So finally, he was a squad leader. So I talked to Colonel Colonel Hillman, and he said, "Okay, we'll send him in." So we were over there about six months, I guess, and his commission came through. And uh, so he was to lead a, a squad. And, and try to try to uh, get some information and try to capture an enemy to get information. So he and uh, I sent he and three other guys out, and they were out. The second night they were out, he radioed back that he was hit and then shot. So we got him back. And so I went down to the AIDS, uh, battalion aid station, and uh, he had his second lieutenant bars on. I told him, I said, I told you not to wear that stuff while you're out there. I said, anyone with, with bars on, they're going to shoot at him. He said, Dooley, I'm going to tell you what. You can take these bars and you can show them. <laughs> I said, I told you not to wear them out there. You're going to get shot. <laughs> he said, you can have these bars. I don't want them no more. <laughs> were, you, were you an officer? Yeah. Okay. And uh, his name was, was Watson, Sergeant Watson, Lieutenant Watson. So you got a commission in the reserves? Yeah, well, when I graduated from Bondary School, I got a second lieutenant. Okay. Then, uh, after I flew so many missions in England, I got first lieutenant. Then, when I left there, I got captain. And uh, so, when I went into Korea, I was a captain. Okay. And, uh, but, uh, but you, you didn't do any flying in Korea? Uh, all the time I flew, a uh, colonel asked me one time, we got some photographs of a certain area, and he said, "Why don't you go back and get a uh, get one of those L5s, which are little little planes, and a camera, and go up there and see if you can't get some pictures? We'd like to some more detail from a lower altitude. And L5s only fly uh, two or three thousand feet. So I went back to an airfield and got a lieutenant." told him what I wanted and I got a camera. And I was to take the camera, you know, leaning over. Well, we got halfway up, about halfway up there, and we began to take a little ground fire. And uh, I think one of the bullets went through one of the wing, on the right wing. And so this, this lieutenant said, Are you sure you want these pictures? I said, the colonel said, we got to have pictures. He said, well, one more shot through that wing and we're going back. <laughs> <laughs> so about two seconds there come another one and he said, we're gone. <laughs> so he peeled off and went back. <laughs> I never did get any pictures. So you know, what were you doing there? You were just serving as a liaison or were you helping yeah. gather and analyze photographs and stuff? Yeah. yeah. And uh, So I never did get pictures of what the colonel wanted. We peeled off, and he said, "I'm gone." <laughs> but I mean, in general, is that is that what your job was there? To yeah, yeah, you, you well, you did a little bit of everything, and uh, you analyzed photographs and uh, tried to pick up targets and uh, tried to pick up enemy emplacements and movements of the enemy.
Those, those planes would fly over every day and take pictures. Compare yesterday's with, with the day before. And see if there was any any movement or any movement of, of especially guns. They moved it from one day to another and, and try to pick targets out for the men. And then would y'all send uh, what fighter bombers to do bombers? Yeah, if either either artillery or fighter bombers, to depending on what target it was. If it was tanks, would send the bombers. I mean the fighter pilot boys after them. Hmm. And, but if it was troops, we'd try to tell our troops where they were so they could either use mortar or artillery on them. And by then did y'all have the new fighter the jet fighters? Yeah. We had, had the F fours. And of course they're obsolete now, but yeah. they were they were a hot item back then. First fighter I ever saw was in Germany though, it was a German fighter. He came at us firing. He didn't hit us. But he was close enough that I saw the lynx fall out of that plane. Really? That was the first fighter I ever saw, and I thought, man, alive, what's he, the, what's he going to zoom? Was it that, uh, the 109 with the, the jet underneath the wing, the two jets underneath the wing? Yeah. And, uh, but I thought, good night, what in the world is that? Was that scary? I mean, had y'all heard, y'all even heard of jet fighters before then? I, I mean, I saw that thing come through there, and, of course, you know, if we're going this way and he's going that way, yeah. it takes a long time for him to turn around and, and come back. But by that time, our fighters were, were at him. And, uh, but he was close enough. I saw those links fall out of them. Was he shooting at you or somebody, another plane? Well, he was shooting at us, but but he had to pull up, evidently, or he would have rammed, rammed us. Wow. And, uh, but, uh, You're sitting there right in the front of the plane and he's coming right at you? Right at us. And he, and he came so fast that, you know, I mean, the time I saw him, uh, he was right there. <laughs> but it was scary, I'll tell you. That, but, uh, but, yeah, we had the F-4s in, uh, in Korea. And, of course, you know, that was a... We, when we hit the Yellow River, there was no place to go. If, if you look at a map, I mean, you're fighting China. I mean, the, the area spreads out for a couple of thousand miles, and there's no place to go uh, unless you're going to spend the next 40 years trying to find them. And so we had to pull back, and then it got to be just a defensive battle then. Uh, I guess you got to meet General, Begar General MacArthur, did you? No, I didn't. I met his son. He was a major. He came in to inspect one time, and the colonel said, "Do we want you?" He said uh, the major is coming in. Wants to inspect the lines. I said, "I don't know anything about the lines." He said, well, "You learn in about five minutes." <laughs> so he came in, and he was dressed all up. I mean, with his pink pants and the winter jacket, uh, coat of pink, pink coat. And Kern says, leading through every mud hole you can find. <laughs> Which I did. <laughs> In about 15 minutes, he pulled off that jacket. And he was muddy, up to his knees in mud. And uh, we inspected, well, we walked through one, one company's lines, and he said, I've seen nothing. You got a pretty good line. You're, you're set up pretty good. <laughs> but he was muddy. <laughs> well, he was inspecting the Air Force lines or what? The, the infantry lines. And, uh, but he, he asked you as an Air Force officer to go yeah. with him? But I, I think it was just because I was the only one standing around at the time. Oh. <laughs> when the, when the f phone came in that he was coming up to inspect, or his jeep was about to arrive, and I was the only one in there. So the colonel said, you, Dooley, you take it. But he said, take it to every mud hole you can find. <laughs> but he, he didn't stay very long because he was muddy from 
because I personally went up some hills that I didn't want to go up. Because you had to climb through the mud to get up there. And uh, the colonel said, take it through every mud hole you can find. But, uh, so how long were you in Korea? About a year, about a year. And, uh, then Colonel Hillman was tr transferred out, or he came home, and, uh, and another colonel came in. We had pulled back in reserve when this new colonel came in, and we'd lost two of, not lost, but they came home. And I was the only officer left in battalion headquarters that had any experience with anything. I can't think of Colonel name. He said, would you go up with me and show me? He had the coordinates of where we were supposed to go back in line. Show me where we're, where we're supposed to go and so forth. So I did. Well, when I got back, our Jeep driver, my Jeep driver came up and said, Dewey, your orders are in to go home. And uh, I, I told him, his name is Adams. I said, come with me. I said, I want you to tell me this <coughs> where the colonel can hear it. <laughs> so we walked over to this tent knew the colonel was in, in his tent. And I said, okay. So, Captain Dooley, your orders came in and you're, you're supposed to go home on the next boat. I said, you kidding? Yeah. So get ready. So the colonel came out of his tent. I said, come in, I'm going to talk to you. So we went in there and he talked for 30 minutes and he said, you're the only, only officer I've got that has any experience. And you know where we're supposed to go. Would, would you volunteer to spend another 10, 20 days? Uh, Colonel, you're asking an awful lot. So we talked for a while and finally he said, okay, go on, I don't have the right to ask you to stay here. So Adams was listening. <laughs> So I walked out of the tent, Adam said, I've got, <clears throat> I've got your stuff, which wasn't anything. I had a bag about so big. And he said, I'll take you, I'll take you down to Yang Dong Po, and you where you can catch a boat. So I, I said, well, we're gone. <laughs> and that was how fast it was. I mean. Well, what? He said, I've got your orders. And he, he had gone by headquarters and got your orders to go home. And so, a fellow named Lewis Maxwell from Tulsa, he and I, well, he was able to, well, at the last he was a supply officer. Uh, he and I met down at Young Don Po, and he had got his orders the same time I got mine. So we came back together. He had been a friend of mine since grade school in Tulsa, or not grade school, junior high. But we, we flew back together then. Or took, we, we didn't fly, we took a boat. 31 days. And uh, I got, what do they call it? Uh, not OD. Anyway, I was in charge of, of the group the first day out, and we had a hundred war brides, exactly a hundred Korean war brides on that boat. And the captain told me, he said, get those war brides up here and talk to them. So I got them. Man, he talked to them like a Dutch uncle. He said, if you've got VD, gonorrhea, whatever, you're not getting off this boat, you're going to have to take the fiscal before you get off the boat in Frisco. We're going to dock three miles outside. 
the doctor's going to come out here and he's going to give you a physical. And if you're, if you've got some, you're not getting off the boat, you're coming back with them. So if you've got it, get off the boat right now. Three of them got up and left. And their husbands were on the boat. These were all girls that had married? The GIs. GIs in Korea? In Korea. But I'm telling you, he talked to them. This was the third trip he had made. And he had, he had to turn some of them back on the previous trip. So he he didn't mention any words with him. But we were fine until we got Frisco and, and the little sailor came up to the captain and wanted to borrow $25. He said, I lost all my money playing poker coming over here. And it's $25 to get your bride into the state. And he said, I don't have the point right on. <laughs> so the captain told him, said, do you have, can you wire your dad or mother or brother or sister or somebody? He said, they're going to kill me because I married a Korean girl in the first place. And the captain said, well, son, I can't, I can't loan you the money. He said, if I did that, I'd be loaning money to everybody. So I don't know what happened. I got off the boat. <laughs> So I don't know what happened to that sailor. He got off, but whether his bride got off or not, I don't know. Well, were you married by, by then? Yeah, yeah. Uh, where, where I, you? I met, well, I met Joe while we are in high school. We went to First Baptist Church there. Met her at church. And we got, we got married uh, before I left to World War II. In fact, we got married in about two weeks. I got notice to report to the Air Force. And they gave me, I think, 10 days or something like that. Well, during that 10 days, I had an appendix attack and had to be operated on appendicitis. So I got a, they gave me a six weeks deferment. Six weeks on the day, I got notice to report <laughs> to Oklahoma City, and uh, and uh, went to San Antonio. Of course, the first day I had to walk a mile. I had supposed to run a mile, and my side was still sore. And I think I was the slowest man on the mile, but in a way it was good because after basic training we had to run that mile again. And I made the most improvement of any man <laughs> in the outfit. But went to San Antonio for pre-flight, and then went to Vernon, Texas for primary. Then went to Garden City, Kansas. And that's where there were five students to an instructor, and my instructor got sick. So the five of us didn't fly for a week, you know, 10 days. So all five of us got washed out because we, we couldn't pass it. They gave you a test every week, a flight test. And we were so far behind, but we couldn't pass it. So all five of us washed out. And then I went to, went to, uh, when they called me in, they said, well, you're qualified to go to the school or navigation school. So I said, well, I'll go to Bonneville School. Well, until the school opened up, I went to Monroe, Louisiana for, I guess, three weeks. And went to uh, code school, learning Morris code, eight hours a day the dot and dash in there. Then I finished that, and the school wasn't open yet, so I went to Laredo, Texas, their gunnery school. And, uh, and I finished the gunnery school, then I went to San Angelo for a moment there school. And 
finish that. We got commission. Then we went to uh, Lincoln, Nebraska. And we got our crew together. And that's where our crew came together in Lincoln, Nebraska. And then we flew over to Lincoln. So was Joe staying in Oklahoma City or Tulsa the whole time? Yeah, she stayed in Tulsa. She came down to, to San Antonio one time. I got to see her during lunch. And uh, the only time I saw her for about 30 minutes. Because we weren't able to, we, you couldn't, I couldn't leave the base, like you couldn't have visitors. But she came on the base and I saw her during lunch. And then she went back to Tulsa. Then uh, she came down to San Angelo when we graduated from Bonneville School. And uh, I had a 10 day leave before we reported to Lincoln, Nebraska, for where our crew got together. And then that was it until. Uh, until I came home, well, like I said, the crew came home after we flew 35 missions. And they kept me as an instructor, and then I stayed over. About another three or four months. I came home. Funny thing, while I was in cadets, I was making $50 a month, plus flight pay, which was half Pay, which was 70, a total of $75. I was sending 50 home. And then when I got commissioned, I forgot the amount of money, but I allocated most of it to her while I was overseas. Then when I got discharged, I got a letter saying that they had overpaid me Fifty dollars a month, all the time I was overseas. They were supposed to stop the fifty and send the allotment of my new pay, whatever it was. I forgot. So I asked Joe, and she said, "Well, yeah, I got two checks, but I just cashed them." <laughs> well, I had written back and said, "I don't know what you're talking about." Well, they sent me cancel checks those $50 checks that she had cashed and said, uh, you need to reimburse those, you can do it. $10 a month we're going to take. But you will reimburse. Well, I had a friend that did not reimburse, so they came out and got his car. Yeah. So, so I reimbursed him at $10 a month <laughs> until I paid that off. How long did that take? Uh, I think I paid ten dollars a month for a while, and then I finally paid up whatever it was. But it was fifty dollars a month. I don't know for a little over a year. That, uh, but they were supposed to stop that fifty and just send her the other money. But just like when I got called back. In, in the Korea, I was supposed to get a $300 clothing allotment to buy new clothes. Well, I finally got that $300, but it was about eight months after I was discharged from Korea. <laughs> <laughs> but I finally got my $300. Uh, but, uh, so after you left Korea, did y'all live in Tulsa? Yeah, we lived in Tulsa until uh, I guess just for a couple of years when I was working for Deep Rock Oil. I originally started out with Sinclair and then I went with Deep Rock Oil. Then Deep Rock was bought out by General American Oil and then they transferred me to Dallas with General American Oil. And then stayed with General American Oil until Three and then Phillips bought the American all out, and I went with Phillips. And 
but I'm going to stay with them about a year and a half because they want to transfer me to New Orleans. And I didn't want to go to New Orleans. <coughs> so I took early retirement from, from Phillips. But I got a large plaque from as my retirement from Phillips Hall <laughs> of two years, or less than two years. But Joe died of cancer. And it was funny, she had contacted, or say contact, she took chemo and radiation and then we went back to the doctor, and I remember she came out crying, and I said, what, what? She said, it's all gone, I can't find it. It's all gone. Well, she died in three months. Then. What'd she have cancer of? <sighs> it, well, it turned out it was all through her body. Hmm. And, but uh, it was so sad because, uh, you know, when they went back and x-rayed her and all this. She said, they can't find it. It's all gone. It, it's cured. I'm cured. And in three months, she <clears throat> woke up when I say woke up, she was laying in bed and I heard her scream and I went in there and uh, I called an ambulance and the ambulance came in a short time and then took her to the hospital Presbyterian. And she died within a couple of hours after we got to the hospital. And the <clears throat> doctor told me that the radiation had, had just weakened her intestines so much that her intestines just exploded hmm. because of the radiation on her, on her body. Then, I'm, of course, I had met Joanne. We knew each other for quite a few years. Her husband died about months before Joanne did. And I don't know, we had known each other for quite a while. Then we, I don't know, we didn't date for a while. And then, anyway, we got together and got married then. We married here. <laughs> Yes, it was. You know, we've been married now for about a little over 13 years. Huh? And I didn't think we'd ever, either one of us would live that long. <laughs> I'd like to say, if I'd have known I was going to live this long, I'd take better care of myself. <laughs> <laughs> but it's been a good marriage. And Janine, now the boys accepted Joanne. Janine didn't. Uh, Janine was bitter for a long time. She's finally come around now. They're, they're good friends now. But uh, Janine just, she, she couldn't accept Joanne. You know, we tried to, you know, she's not replacing Joe, but uh, She finally came around. They're good friends. You know. But it was it was tough there for a while with Janine. I know we married in Christmas just a short time, and we had a Christmas over at John's. And Janine gave her a little fifty cent present. Joanne. I mean, we knew she was bitter, and, uh, but I know it, uh, it hurt Joanne that, that, that she would do that, but we understood why. She, she, was, she just couldn't accept it, Joanne. But I think everything's turned out fine. Uh, the boys have always accepted her.
but that's about it. What, what did you do with the oil companies? Uh, I was a landman, what's called landman. Now, I was in the office most of the time. Uh, they, uh, I was what they call a lease records supervisor for a number of years. That's where <clears throat> when the leases, brokers sent the leases in, we would analyze the lease and set up records to pay annual rent. In other words, most leases, when they take a lease from a, from a landowner, they agree to pay them X dollars a year until they drill. If they don't drill, they'll pay them X dollars an acre until they drill on the, on the land. And uh, probably 95% of the leases never get drilled. They're taking this on a hunch or a, a guess or they run seismic crews and uh, try to determine if there's oil under that land. And if, if there is, then they'll, they'll lease up a whole block. And then their records are set up to pay the annual rent and advise the attorneys and the engineering and so forth what, what terms the lease is and what obligations are in the lease because <coughs> No two leases are exactly the same. It depends on what the landowner wants and what you would give him or give in to him. If he says you'll pay me every 30 days and you want the lease bad enough, you're going to pay him every 30 days until you drill them. And, uh, uh, any other obligation that, that he wants and you're willing to give him or give in to him, You've got to set it up in the system and and advise your drilling contractors and so forth that we, we've got an obligation to drill on this guy's land by September the 13th or whatever. And so you set up all this in records and so that you can pull it up. Of course, years ago you didn't have computers, so you had to do it all by hand. And, uh, All your checks were written in the land department or lease department, whichever way you call it. And uh, all these obligations you pulled up by hand, or not pulled up, but you had them set up in books. And uh, most of them had a, had a large book or set of books with everything in it. And then you had monthly books where you went through the January book, uh, say in November, to check to see what obligations you had in January. And uh, usually had two sets because one set can get destroyed. In fact, we had a fire in our lease department here in, in Dallas, and uh, one set of records got burned. And luckily, we had another set. Of course, that was before computers. And, uh, but uh, one one set was completely burned, and the other set was scorched. And I know we had to move everything down to the basement. And we hired a crew to come in and <coughs> save the records because <coughs> they were scorched so bad that if you tried to pick up the paper, it would crumble. And so they were shoving a piece of paper under it and picking it up and putting it on a, on a Xerox machine or a copy machine uh, because they were, they were scorched so bad that, that they would just crumble if you, if you touched them. And, but uh, a typewriter 
cord and caught fire. Hmm. How and why? Evidently, the girl left the typewriter on, but the cord ran across the carpet, and that's where the fire started. But uh, uh, they, they called me, it was about 3 o'clock in the morning, and they called me and said, your office is on fire, you better get up here. <laughs> so we made, a, made a, a rule then that you left nothing on your desk at night when you left. That it went in the cabinet because everything on the desk was burning. And you never know exactly what you leave on your desk. But if, if it was on the desk, it was burnt that day. And it didn't really blaze until it had smoked, until they broke in the room, and then it, it just exploded. But we lost a lot of stuff. I want, I want to hear a bit more about you. Growing up on the farm, did, did you have any jobs on the farm? What did you do? Well, really, because I left the farm <clears throat> at about five years old. Oh, okay. And uh, that's when you moved to Tulsa. Yeah. One thing, one thing, I remember. I went out for whatever reason to get the horses. We had some horses, and there were a, a draw or a little creek bed that was dry and I was right behind this horse and I hit it to try to get it to move and it kicked me <laughs> and it cut me in the eye right here right under the eye of course we were out in the country and I can remember it because mother took the cool oil out of a lamp and poured it in a pan and I held my head down in that pan in that cool oil to cure that cut <laughs> on my eye. And it left a scar for years, it's gone, it's practically gone now. But now they use cold oil for everything now. <laughs> and uh, it, uh, I can still remember that, of holding my face down in that cold oil. Because uh, I remember seeing her pour it out of the lamp into this pan. Keep that. So I guess it healed up all right. Probably if it had been in a city that had taken eight or ten stitches in it. Yeah. And, uh, luckily, it hit me just above this cheekbone, and it, and it didn't break the cheekbone. But I remember hitting that horse with a switch, and it kicked me back down the, down the gully. <laughs> but. Uh, do you have a lot of school books when you're in the in the uh, that first school? No, it was funny. Uh, I was over at my grandson's house the other day when they were getting all their school books ready, and, and, and uh, <coughs> little Casey asked me what books I had to buy when I went to school. I said a number two pencil and a big chief tablet, and that was it. That's all you needed. Grade school. Number two pencil and a big chief tablet. That was all. That's all there was. So what's a big chief tablet? <laughs> <laughs> I said, well, I don't know whether you even buy them anymore or not, but it's just because uh, you have to have a loose leaf notebook now. And I said, this was a tablet with paper, and a line of paper. But that's all we needed back then was a number two pencil and a big chief tablet. I can't think of any other questions I got to ask. Oh, that's about it. That's about my life story. <laughs> I guess I've had a pretty good life. Um, at least I'm. A, at least. I'm decent health wise anyway and I had a heart attack while I was still working but it must have been real mild because well I woke up early I don't know three or four o'clock in the morning and I was, my chest was just killing me so I called my doctor and he said meet me at the hospital it's a press 
and I I got up and drove over there myself, which he chastised me for. But anyway, he ran EKG and this, that, and the other. He said, you're fine. You just hide a hernia, giving you trouble. So I went on and went to work. But then the next week or 10 days, I was just a week, I couldn't. So I called him and I said, we need to check this again. So you know, I went back over. He ran another EKG and he said, well, I'm gonna send you over to Dr. So-and-so. So I went over there in another building, Professor He ran an EKG and came back out and he, he said, shut the door. He said, do you smoke? And I had a pack of cigarettes in my pocket. He said, you don't even work. He said, you had a heart attack 10 days ago. And he said, I don't want you to. He said, I'm gonna call a cab and send you home and I don't want you to get out of bed for a week. The only reason to get out of bed is go to the bathroom. I said, I've got to go back to the office. I, I said, I dictated all morning long and I got to sign a letter. He said, you're not going back to the office. He said, you're going home. And like I said, don't get out and get in bed and don't get out. You have to go to the bathroom for a week. I said, okay, but I got my car here. I'll drive home. Okay. Well, I went back to the office and signed all the letters. Then I went home. <laughs> but Joe's father, who worked for an Arabian oil company, came in about an hour, hour after I got home. He was home on a, what it called, a six months or an eight months leave. And he was two pack of cigarette a day smoker. And here, I, <coughs> I was to give up smoking and here the guy came in the house smoking two packs a day. And he stayed for, I don't know, three or four days. <coughs> but he was well enough, he'd go outside to smoke and he wouldn't smoke in the house. But after a week, Dr. Coleman said, call me in a week. And I said, you mean if, I, if I'm alive, I'll call you? And he said, that's right. If you're not dead, call me. So I called him, and this was in the summer, hot August. He said, okay, you can go back to bed. He said, tomorrow, get up and walk in the house. As long as you can walk called me. It was about four minutes and I was spooked. I couldn't even take another step. He said, good, now do the same thing tomorrow. Well, I did the next day and it was about eight minutes and it doubled every day. He said, okay, when you can walk a mile, you can go back to work. So it took me about a month, a month and a half, and I went back to work and I haven't had no more trouble since then. Mm. And, uh, but uh, that one little spell. But it's. But I've had no trouble since then. I tried to take a physical at least every six months. But I, I went out to the VA for the first time about two years ago. And I've still got my doctor. I keep my appointment with my doctor. In fact, a couple of weeks ago, I took a physical. And then once every six months, I get a physical out to VA. So neither one know that I have the other one going. <laughs> and I thought, well, I might as well just keep it going. And at least that way, I, I get a physical out. Because when you get my Medicare only pays physical for once a year. And the VA is once every six months. So I've got both of them going. And I thought, well, I might as well. It never hurts to, you know, have an examination. So unless something happens, I guess I'll live tomorrow anyway. I guess that's about it. Okay, I guess we're done. <laughs>